Welcome to EPG Parchala. I am Anna Kurian and I teach at the University of Hyderabad in the Department of English. Today we are going to be doing the module on Shakespeare in Comedy, which is in the paper English Literature from 1590 to 1798. We shall be studying the features of Shakespeare in Comedy and our main fo focus will be on Twelfth Night, one of the most popular comedies of Shakespeare and ones which are still presented and performed and studied today in most university curricula. When we think about Shakespeare, we are speaking of a man who lived between 1564 and 1616. He lived and worked during the reigns of Queen Elizabeth I and James I. He lived in a period when there was considerable peace, prosperity, when there was social as well as political peace in the country of England. And as a result, there was a lot of literature which was being produced during this period. We are privileged because we get to study 36 plays by Shakespeare. In this module, however, we shall be looking only at the features of Shakespeare in comedy. And then later on, we will be studying the play Twelfth Night with respect to its themes, its characterization, its critics, and what has been said and done with it in recent times. So now let us begin with the life of William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare wrote a total of 37 plays which are usually divided into tragedies, comedies and historical plays. And this was the characterization and the categorization that was given in the first folio which was published in 1623. Now of course we have an additional category in the number of plays that he has written and this is the tragic comedy or the romance the four or five plays written towards the closing of his career, which then gave us tragedy in the initial sections and yet went on to give us a happy or a comedic ending. His comedies include the early comedies, which particularly the extremely famous and popular comedy of errors as well as the taming of the shrew, but the later comedies of which the most famous are Twelfth Night, A Midsummer Night's Dream, Much Ado About Nothing and As You Like It. Today, our focus is Twelfth Night. When we think of a Shakespearean comedy, we are not really thinking in terms of a farce or a slapstick. We are thinking in terms of what is usually called a romantic comedy. These comedies are called romantic comedies not because of the prevalence of romance, so much as the fact that all of these comedies ended in marriage. They ended in at least one, but sometimes even as many as four marriages. And that is why they are called romantic comedies. These comedies also feature something which interests us tremendously in contemporary times, extremely strong women characters. If Shakespeare's tragedies are dominated by men and are named after men, then these ca uh, comedies are actually, though they are not given the names of women characters, they feature stronger women characters than they do men characters. And there is a tradition which says that these women characters were modeled upon Queen Elizabeth I herself because by the time his career ended, he had written his comedies largely during the reign of the Queen herself, not during the reign of the King. Major themes during the Shakespeare, in the Shakespearean comedies include themes of illusion, appearance and reality, deception, disguise and of course love. Romantic love and the course that true love takes in this world with, of course, obstacles in the achievement of marriage is one of the main prevalent themes in most of his comedies. There is usually a young couple, if not many young couples. There are obstacles to their coming together in marriage. Either one of them does not love the other or there is parental obstruction. But there will be an obstacle which is then overcome during the course of the comedy. And, of course, it ends in multiple marriages. The dialogues are clever and witty as in all Shakespeare, but they also are jokes embedded in the dialogue itself, especially puns and riddles. We also have some situational comedy, especially with stock characters like the fool and the drunken knight, both of whom are seen in Twelfth Night itself. Other comic trends during this period include the city comedy as well as the comedy of humours. Now, neither of these were used by Shakespeare. So, while we have people like Ben Johnson who wrote the city comedy and the comedy of humours, Shakespeare actually only wrote romantic comedies. He, in, in addition to this, we might also like to think about the fact that many of 
the critics in uh, the late 19th century and the early 20th century have seen his comedies as being festive comedies, that they were created in the context of certain Elizabethan festivals and that they show us a world in which festivity and a lot of a holiday mood is seen taking place. They are also, of course, to do with the idea of the carnival because what we see is that the traditional rules and mores of society are overturned during the comedies itself. We have many major critics of Shakespearean comedy. One or two of the main important ones whom you should be thinking about and reading include C. L. Barber, who wrote Shakespeare's festive comedy, H. B. Charlton, Northrop Frye, and Leo Salinger. All of these critics also, of course, focus on the fact that these comedies are about wish fulfillment. They are about happy endings. These are not comedies in which you have at the end disappointed people turning away. The main characters will all achieve happiness in some form or the other. They are also critics who tell us that marriage is the central idea of all these romantic comedies. When we look at Twelfth Night, what we see is a story of a play which is about two couples at least and by the end of the play, a possible third. Twelfth Night was first recorded as having been produced in a diary entry. We hear about it in 1602. We are also now of the opinion that the play would have been written sometime between 1600 and 1601. As with all Shakespeare's plays, the play does not have an original plot line. Shakespeare borrowed from people and this play also seems to have been borrowed from a play called, an Italian play called Gli in Ganati or Barnabas Rich's story, Apollonius and Scylla. The subplot, however, and the subplot in Twelfth Night is a major part of its attraction. The subplot is supposed to have been entirely Shakespeare's own invention. The title is itself significant. This is one of the few plays of Shakespeare in which he provides us with a subtitle. So it's called Twelfth Night or What You Will. And that is interesting because both of them do not give us any indication of what happens within the text. Twelfth night re refers to the 12 days of festivities after Christmas, beginning on Christmas Eve and ending on January 6th. So the speculation usually is that Twelfth night, the play, might have been a reference to the fact that it was first produced on the 12th night after Christmas or that its themes echo the kind of festive atmosphere which was seen during these 12 days of Christmas. Also, of course, is the fact that the 12th day after Christmas was supposed to be a day when the traditional hierarchies were inverted, when anything was possible, when people dressed up as their betters or as the opposite gender. So, 12th night might be a reference to all of these. But then what of the subtitle, what you will? Did Shakespeare mean that this play could be read in whichever way you want it? that you could do what you will with it? Or was he mocking the custom itself of giving subtitles by providing one that added no additional information to the play? In the fact that we do not see anything, we do not get a reference to either the themes or the characters of the play, how then do we explain a subtitle such as what you will, except that we might say that it's, we can do what we like with the play. The story of the play is itself very simple. You have a set of twins. Viola and Sebastian. They are of course of the nobility and on a sea voyage Viola, the, their ship is broken up and Sebastian is lost. Viola is washed up on the shores of a kingdom called Illyria. So the play begins with Viola arriving on the beaches of Illyria, finding out that this is a country which is ruled by somebody called Duke Orsino and Duke Orsino is himself in love with a countess, Olivia. Except that Olivia is in mourning because of the death of her brother and refusing to meet any man. We begin with this very slender kind of beginning where you have a heroine who has arrived in a country where she cannot meet a woman because initially when Viola arrives, she hopes to take service with Olivia and be safe over there. Instead, she is forced to dress up as a man and take service with the Duke Orsino. So she dresses up as a boy, calls herself Cesario and becomes the page boy to the Duke. The Duke himself, who is busy languishing in love, in love with the idea of being in love, decides that he will send Cesario to woo Olivia. Olivia, of course, as soon as she meets Cesario, falls crazily in love with him. 
and is determined to woo him and marry him as well. If this is the main plot, you have a subplot also which involves Sir Toby. Sir Toby who is attractively surnamed Sir Toby Belch, right? which gives us an indication of the kind of man he is. Somebody of a great appetite, belching, eating, drinking, enjoying his life. And you have his sidekick and his foolish friend, Sir Andrew Aguti. They are served by and entertained by the maidservant of Olivia's house, Maria. And you have a fool, Feste, as well. The opposition to Sir Toby and Andrew Aguatique's antics in the house is from somebody called Malvolio, who is the steward to the Countess Olivia. Now, what happens during the play is that as Cesario comes to woo Olivia day after day, Olivia falls more in love with him. As the days progress, she is not interested in Duke Orsino. Orsino, on the other hand, is growing more and more crazily in love with him, with her. And as a result, there comes a day when she decides that she must marry or, uh, Cesario on the same day itself. What, however, has happened is that in the meantime, Sebastian has also been washed up on the shores of Illyria. He has come into Illyria, discovered that there is such a countess over here, is mistaken by Olivia to be the twin that he has. He Therefore, then Olivia thinks that he is Cesario and possibly marries him. Now, when Cesario returns, it is to be told that he is now married to Olivia. The Duke Orsino, angered by this, comes to find out what the truth is regarding the matter. Then, of course, the whole denouement take place, takes place, wherein we discover that both the twins are there. Cesario is then revealed to be actually a girl. The Duke decides to marry her as a reward for his, her faithful service. The marriage between Olivia and Sebastian is happily, happily ended in the sense that they decide to continue with the marriage. They are happy with each other. And all seems set for a really happy ending, except that what has happened to the foolish steward, Malvolio, and of course to Andrew Aguacic, Toby Belge, and Maria. Now, Maria and Toby, Sir Toby, have together hatched a plot to make fun of Malvolio, who is puritanical, but who is also ambitious. He wants to marry Olivia himself. As a result, they send him a letter, pretending that it has been written by Olivia. The letter itself says that if he really loves her, then he should come before her cross gartered smiling, etc. He does so, only to be then sent away by Olivia and imprisoned in a dark room. Feste the clown and the others make fun of him, and eventually when he is released, he comes back before Olivia and says that he will have his revenge on the back of them. When we look at this play, what we see is that it's all about the travails of love. Except that love itself is made fun of by Shakespeare because we are told that the Duke, Orsino, is more in love with the idea of being in love. He is not really in love with Olivia as much as he is in love with the idea of himself as romantic lover, somebody who is languishing for love somebody who is constantly waiting for the loved one to receive him, etc. So, even when we look at the themes, what we see is that the traditional themes of the romantic comedy are being then turned inside out by Shakespeare. Let us then consider Shakespeare, Twelfth Night as a Shakespearean comedy. In continuation of all the other plays that Shakespeare wrote, it has a five-act structure. It also has an exposition, a complication, a climax, a denouement, and a resolution. And the resolution is, of course, happy. Comedy arises in this play from both situation as well as character. And this is interesting because situation means that there is a circumstance which then makes it funny for us, the viewers, not necessarily funny for the people within the play. And we see this in two circumstances as an example, if you will. One of them is the fact that when Sebastian comes on to comes into Illyria, Cesario is of course unsure of his arrival. She does not know that he has survived and that he is here on the same island as she is. And then there is mistaken identity because Olivia marries the wrong person, who is actually the right person in a sense because she could not have married a woman dressed as a man. So she is actually marrying the right person because she marries the brother who is exactly the same as the twin sister. So we as an audience know the truth and we find it funny. But the people on stage actually don't find it so funny because they are still wondering what exactly is happening. How is it that somebody wants to marry me the first minute that she sees me? So we find it funny and this is situational humor. The other one, of course, the most famous one in Twelfth Night is the whole Malvolio story where Malvolio goes before Olivia 
dressed in yellow garters, cross garters, smiling, wearing yellow stockings. And Olivia doesn't understand what has happened to her sober puritanical steward. He is always serious. He is always judgmental. And here he is smiling nonstop, grinning like the Cheshire cat. And at the same time, wearing strange clothing, behaving in a weird way. We as audience are again privileged to know the truth and we find it funny. What happens to Malvolio is of course not funny. He is further locked in a dark room. Feste the clown goes there and makes fun of him. Claims that it is not dark, that Malvolio must have lost his senses because he himself can see clearly. And all the time we understand what is going on. That there is a joke being played out, a practical joke being played out by the characters. And that Malvolio is not privy to the joke. We are. This is situational character. A situational comedy. There is also, of course, the comedy which arises from character. And this we see also in, again, Malvolio. Malvolio, who is serious and ambitious, is then that characteristic of his is made a butt of humor. And we are supposed to laugh at the fact that he who is ambitious to marry his mistress, Olivia, the countess, is actually then turned into a butt of humor because of that ambition of his. We also find humor in other places, there, and this is significantly so in the characterization of Sir Andrew Aguchi. Andrew is somebody who is a coward, and Sir Toby then makes him, forces him into a fight with uh, Viola, dressed up as Cesario. And the humor arises because Viola, who is actually a girl, dressed up as a boy, is equally uncertain. She doesn't want to fight, Sir Andrew does not want to fight. And there we have both situational as well as characteristic humor arising out of this whole problem that is posed by it. About Malvolio's treatment by Andrew Aguacic, Maria and Sir Toby, many critics have felt that it was undeserved. Indeed, Samuel Johnson said that he fully deserved it because he was so judgmental and so strict with people like Sir Toby who only wanted to enjoy life. But others like Charles Lamb felt that we should have been more sympathetic when we looked at him. Because it is not that he himself is wicked. It is because he wants to preserve order and decorum in the house of his mistress, the Countess Olivia. When we think about subplots and the Malvolio, Sir, Sir Toby, Maria and Sir Andrew episode is a subplot, we are also then thinking about issues such as staging as well as setting. This is something that is staged. When uh, Maria gives the letter pretending to have been written by the Countess Olivia, they are staging a joke. So the, a practical trick which is being played out within a play is, as in a lot of Shakespeare, including Hamlet as well as Midsummer Night's Dream, what we are watching is a play within a play, which is being set for us. We are also looking at things like setting. And over here it's important because though it's called Twelfth Night, though it's about Christian festivities, we are being told that it is in a land called Illyria. Now, Illyria is a real place set in modern Albania, but it is a place without a coastline. So when Shakespeare creates a land, he is creating a land which is outside of accepted geographies of the time. So when we think about these, about this play, we should also then consider these two aspects. Then, of course, we come to the main ideas over here, including something called characterization. The main characters in Twelfth Night include, of course, centrally, Olive, uh, Viola, Olivia and Orsino. Sebastian enters halfway through the play and so we don't really look at him until much of the play is over. Central to any discussion of Twelfth Night is the character of Viola. Viola has been and continues to be a favorite of many critics. She is one in the line of the so-called strong women characters of Shakespeare's comedies. And yet Viola is also somebody who is gentle, who is womanly and feminine because she is easily scared. She worries about what the future will hold for her. She is also unsure because she has been washed up on a strange country's shores without any masculine protection. And she has neither brother nor father who will help her to lead her life. And she has to take control of her own life. The fact that she then dresses up as a boy and enters into service as a page boy with Duke Orsino shows her moving away from this frail, feminine kind of woman to somebody who can take decisions regarding her own life and try to live her own life as best as she can. Which is interesting also because initially she wants to take service not with Orsino but with Olivia because she feels she'll be safer with another woman. It's only when that road is also close to her that she then decides to be a servant to Duke Orsino. What becomes further interesting is of course that as soon as she meets Orsino she falls in love with him. 
So then we wonder about this idea that women are so easily prone to fall in love. And yet she, when she does fall in love, also maintains silence regarding it. And she says that like patients on a monument, she will just keep quiet about the fact that she loves her employer. In addition, she is also forced to woo for her employer another woman. Something again that goes against her spirit and yet she does it. So you have the portrayal of a woman who then does whatever she can to survive. And in that sense, Viola does become a picture of a strong woman. In opposition to Viola, you have the Countess Olivia. Now the Countess Olivia is interesting because Olivia is also somebody who is given to dramatizing herself. She has suffered the loss of her brother and she decides that for seven years, the sun will not see her face, that she is going to be in mourning for seven years for the loss of her beloved brother. It's also set up for us in opposition to Viola herself, who has also lost a brother, but who does not believe that she can mourn because she believes that she has to somehow live. On the other hand, Olivia can afford to mourn for seven long years. And it is because she wants to be in mourning that she will then not meet Duke Orsino. This, of course, then is again shaken for us, destabilized for us, because the minute she sees Cesario, she falls in love with him. And she forgets all about mourning her brother. She wants to get married to Cesario. And eventually, she will, of course, force Sebastian to marry her. Finally, there is the Duke himself, Orsino. Orsino, who is a character who is interested in listening to music, listening to songs, who is interested in, of course, wooing Olivia, but is also interested in talking philosophy with Cesario, the page boy, whom Oli who is actually Viola. And when he talks to Viola, it is when you actually get to know Orsino, clipped of all these other dramatic instincts that he has for listening to music and pretending to be this great lover. So when we look at Viola and Orsino together, what we see is a friendship which is being developed there. A friendship between two people, which is irrespective in some senses of gender, because they both think, I mean, uh, Orsino thinks that Viola is a young boy, and so he talks unguardedly to her. A friendship which later on, of course, will transform into marriage. Finally, there is Sebastian. Sebastian, who comes in and who is completely this masculine prototype, who comes in, gets married to Olivia without even a second thought, is willing to engage in a duel asked to do so, whereas Viola, who is dressed up as Cesario, the young boy, is very scared of fighting, is very scared of swords, is very scared of fighting in a duel and doing any of these things. Sebastian, on the other hand, is this typical male who is full of action, de decides to do whatever he has to do, and once he's married, he's like, okay, we will continue with the marriage. Not a bad idea, even though he has no idea about whom he has married or the person that she is. So you have then Shakespeare doing something very interesting with the theme of romantic love itself because the theme of romantic love is shown to us to be more, mostly in the heads of the characters. They all imagine themselves to be in love. Or say, you know, who thinks through the course of the play, who thinks that he is in love with Olivia, in the end marries Viola in the last scene without actually suffering even two minutes of remorse. Once he knows that Olivia is already married. Once he knows that Viola is a young girl and not a boy, as he thought, he's like, okay, so now we can get married. Which is interesting because what Shakespeare is also saying is that love is not something which is lasting. Love is not something which, is, which you grow into. But love can be also of the moment, of a single moment in time. But the Olivia, uh, but the Viola or Sino marriage is also something that we should think about because these are two people who have become friends. And therefore, then when they get married, though Viola will, of course, change into being and dress up as a woman once again. They are also people who have known each other as friends. And therefore, then their marriage stands a greater chance of success, if you will, than the other marriage, which is of two complete strangers, Sebastian and Olivia. In addition to all of these main characters, you have a bunch of subsidiary characters. So Toby Belch, Sir Andrew Aguacheek, uh, Maria, the maidservant, Feste, the clown. Fabian, who is also a servant in the house of Olivia, and you have two sea captains. Now, what is interesting about all these minor characters is that Sir Toby Belch and uh, Sir Andrew Aguchik together provide one of the stereotypes, the stock characters in Shakespearean comedy. Characters who are knights and yet who are foolish, who are interested only in having a good time. And Sir Toby Belch uh, in some ways resembles the greatest knight of them all, Falstaff, in the Henry IV plays. Now, these are people who, are, who have no money of their own, but who want to lead a good life, and who 
spend their time drinking, eating, playing games and basically just enjoying themselves. Maria who is a maid servant to Olivia also does all of this. What is interesting is that in the end because of the beautiful trick that Maria played upon Malvolio, Sir Toby decides to marry her. What we have then is an instance of social mobility through marriage over here in this instance as well. The themes of the play include of course the theme of love and courtship and marriage. And love is further destabilized because at the end when Orsino comes to know that Olivia has married supposedly Cesario, he says that he will kill Cesario. So does friendship really count? Or is it that in the jealous pursu pursuing of his love, he is willing to then kill off a friend? You have lots of these small questions which are being raised by the text. And one of the most important of these questions is what happens between Sebastian and the sea captain who, who rescues him, Antonio. Sebastian and Antonio come into Illyria even though Antonio has been forbidden to come into Illyria because of previous brawls in Illyria. So there is a price upon his head in Illyria and yet he follows Sebastian into Illyria and is willing to die if he can only save him. Interesting because Shakespeare also raises homoerotic and homosocial bonds over here. The love and friendship between Sebastian and Antonio and the love and friendship between Duke Orsino and Viola dressed up as Cesario are both seen as instances of same-sex love, homoerotic friendship, homosocial bonds which are there between two men. It's important also because during this period, the Elizabethan early modern period, Homosocial bonds between men were given more importance than the bonds of romantic love between men and women. The bonds of romantic love between men and women were transitory, but the friendship between men was supposed to be something which was of greater importance. And we see that in this play also. What we also see, of course, is the idea of the Puritan, which Shakespeare mocks at some length. Malvolio is the Puritan, somebody who believes in strict ways of life, somebody who wants to lead a very sober life with decorum and order and yet Shakespeare makes him the butt of so much mockery that finally he is locked up in a dark room. People come and laugh at him and there is then an implicit comment about the fact that Shakespeare is endorsing festivity, Shakespeare is endorsing a holiday mood, enjoyment rather than the serious approach to life. In the end when you have each character getting married and you have three marriages, you have the Sir Toby and Maria marriage, you have the Duke Orsino and Viola marriage and you have the Sebastian and Olivia marriage. What you have also is what you will. Each of them gets what they wanted in life. Finally, you also have the idea that if this is a play about social mobility, then whose marriages can be seen as contributing to upward social mobility. One of course there is the Sir, uh, Sir Toby and Maria marriage. Sir Toby might be poor, Maria but is a servant maid. And he marries a servant maid, though he is of the nobility. But there is also the idea that both Viola as well as Sebastian are people without any property, any land, no background as such in economics. They are both noble born, but they do not really have any property as such here in this kingdom. And yet they both make good marriages within the text to the two most powerful people in Illyria. So when we look at that, then we are also thinking in terms of social mobility and stability where noble marries noble and they live happily ever after. But there is also the fact that within this text, what happens to gender identities? Viola, and we should all never forget that during Shakespeare's time, men, young men or young boys played the roles of women. Now Viola in the play is a young woman. But she dresses up as a young man and then goes and woos a young woman. So you have this destabilizing of fixed gender identity. What you have is women who are wooing other women, men who are, or women dressed as men who are wooing other women. You have people who form friendships based not upon gender but upon their appearance. So you have a lot of destabilizing through the text of the idea of gender itself. And marriage is not based upon love or understanding, but upon love which is almost like madness. Finally, then we can think of Twelfth Night as a classic example of a Shakespearean comedy. If lots of Shakespearean comedies were built upon the idea of 
identities which are not fixed, identities which are confused, then Shakespeare, uh, Twelfth Night is a perfect example of one of those. And also of the fact that though it is a romantic comedy, it undermines ideas of traditional romantic love. There are plenty of stage and screen adaptations of Twelfth Night. One of the most popular and one of the most recent is a teenage film which, which is called She's the Man, wherein you have Twelfth Night which has then been moved into a school and you have young people playing the roles of all the principal characters. In terms of criticism, Samuel Johnson described this as an elegant and easy play. You have, of course, Harold Bloom, who saw it as basically about the instability of identity. And in the latest readings, you have a lot of focus which has been given to gender, erotic, gender equations and homoerotics in the play. Critics such as Valerie Traub and R.W. Maslin have both focused on the fact that fixed gender identities and same-sex love are something that is central to the idea of Twelfth Night. We have come to the end of the module on Shakespeare and comedy and we have looked in detail at the play Twelfth Night. I would suggest that you can maybe read something about Twelfth Night, maybe the Harold Bloom criticism on Twelfth Night or even the introduction to English Renaissance comedy by Alexander Liggett. In addition, if you could watch on YouTube, you could watch either the film What You Will or you could watch the film of Twelfth Night itself as it has been directed by Kenneth Branagh. Thus then you would have an overview of the play itself in which then you could trace the themes of Shakespearean comedy that we have looked at, the main features of Shakespearean comedy and romantic comedy, but also the main themes in Twelfth Night as well as the characters and characterization in Twelfth Night. I hope this has been a clear lesson and that you have understood everything to do with Twelfth Night. Thank you.